Hello, I'd like to tell you a story, if that's all right. Um, my name is Talon, and the story I'm going to tell you is of um, the last 17 or so years of my life and uh, the things that I've gone through, uh, and maybe it might help uh, during this time. So if we go back to the beginning of March in 2003. I was an active PE teacher, uh, living the dream as far as I was concerned. You know, I love sport. It was it was my passion. You know, uh, and also I love teaching. So I was I was doing the perfect job for me. Um, I was living in Bath, which is a beautiful city. Ever been there? Wonderful. Uh, had a lovely girlfriend. Teaching in a nice school, and had a ten year plan. Uh, the ten year plan was to become a head teacher. Uh, the first part of that plan was to go out to Africa, gain experience in a completely different culture. Uh, I had a job to go to at the Mombasa Academy. I was going to go there for a couple of years or so, then come back to the UK, become head of a P department, and then become deputy head and then a head teacher. And really, that's where I expected to be now. And, you know, we all have plans uh, for the future. Uh, some are uh, long term and what we want to be in you know 10 years time uh, some are a more medium term you know what we're going to do at Christmas and some are short term sort of you know when are we ever going to leave the house um, so we all have these plans in our lives and, and every now and then something comes in the way uh, and it stops us uh, for me uh, as you can see uh, the thing that stopped me was a week after the other photograph I was involved in a motorcycle accident uh, car pulled out, I had to swerve to avoid them, came off the bike, uh, fell off. Uh, everything was all right because I was wearing all my leathers. However, um, when I fell off, I was sort of, my path took me onto the other side of the road and straight into the, uh, the path of the oncoming traffic. So car went straight over the top of me. Uh, the car hit me in between the shoulder blades and that shattered two bones we call T4, T5 was rolled under the car, uh, breaking bones in my neck at C6, C7, uh, punch in my left lung. Uh, oh, all sorts of really bad stuff happened to me. Um, uh, luckily, I didn't die. Um, I came out of the back of the car, couldn't believe that I was still alive, uh, having been rolled around underneath it. Uh, only see another car coming towards me. I was like, oh no, I'm gonna get run over twice. This is not my day. Uh, unfortunately, that car stopped just a few feet away from my face and uh, the driver got out of his car and bearing in mind what he had just seen, i.e. me getting run over, um, he came up and he looked down at me and he goes, you're a mate, you all right? I was like looking at him thinking, are you, are you mad? I, I've just been run over by a car. Blatantly, I am not all right. Get on the phone to the ambulance. Uh, he did. The ambulance took about 25 minutes to arrive, during which time I was bleeding into my right lung. Uh, and it got to a point where I only had about half a litre of lung capacity uh, uh, and I lost consciousness just as the ambulance crew arrived. And it's all credit to them uh, that they were able to, to save me, to stabilise me. Uh, and I was taken to Salisbury. Uh, Salisbury has a specialist spinal unit, the Duke of Cornwall Spinal Injuries Unit. And it was there that I began a new life. Um, initially, not a life that I really wanted. Uh, in one moment of time, I'd been an active PE teacher with all these dreams and aspirations. Uh, the next moment, I'm barely alive. And when I had enough uh, sort of uh, consciousness, you know, I was in that consciousness all the time. And when I had enough about me to have a chat with the consultant, he told me that, you know, I'd been involved in this accident, that I was going to be paralysed from the chest down. Uh, I was never going to walk again. Uh, and due to the severity of my injuries, I was possibly going to be, uh, well, I had a 30% chance of survival. Uh, and if I and if I did survive, I could expect to be in hospital for about two years due to the complex nature of all the injuries that I had sustained. So there we go. PE teacher one moment, paraplegic the next, barely holding on to life. Not a life that I wanted. I just didn't think that I would cope being in a wheelchair. I didn't think that I was going to ever have any happiness. I didn't think I was going to have any purpose. 
in life. Uh, and at the time, I just wanted them to switch off the life support. I just wanted to die. Obviously, there's this thing called the Hippocratic Oath, and you know, doctors and nurses can't just go around switching off the life support machines here in the UK. And I'm very glad that they didn't, because I have found since that time that there is lots that I can do. But at the time when change happens, it is very difficult to see further down, to see the the in the, see in the distance. You know, we see what is happening immediately and it is very difficult to look ahead to see if there is happiness and the re, and, you know purpose for us in the future. Uh, and I was struggling, you know, I was going through a massive range of emotions uh, from uh, frustration and anger through to hatred. You know, I'd have hated anybody that could walk because, you know, they could do the simple thing that I couldn't. Uh, got over that, don't hate everybody at all. I think everyone's wonderful. Um, but, you know, there are still groups of people who have had something similar happen to them <clears throat> and they are very bitter and angry and they resent others uh, that have the ability to do the things that they can't. And, you know, they're, they're in all walks of life. You know, they're not just always disabled, they can be able-bodied as well. And they're normally the people that uh, you've come across them, they sort of, they're maybe in the corner of the room, it's all doom and gloom, and they will try and drag you down to their level. They will bring everybody down. Um, and certainly when I was in hospital, there were, unfortunately, a few of these people around that were going to bring you down. Um, and I just didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but I was really fortunate that a guy came in for a, a regular checkup. So us paraplegics, every sort of 18 months or so, we go in for a checkup, like an MOT. Uh, and uh, the nurses asked him to come and have a chat with me because I, obviously I was struggling. Uh, and he told me that, you know, it was going to be tough. You know, he was honest and said, you know, times like this, it's tough and it's going to be hard work for you. However, there are things that you can do. And he started to list all the different things that he had done in the four years that he'd been in the chair. And then he finally mentioned, oh, yeah, one last thing just before he left. He says, oh, yeah, I've just come back from skiing. And I looked at him and I thought, you you little bit... Touched in the head, mate. I said, how could you possibly go skiing? You're paralysed. No one can go skiing if you're paralysed. You know, I've been skiing in the past. You need to stand up. You put a pair of boots on. You know, you've got the skis underneath and that's how you go skiing. He said, no, 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 honest. Right, what you do is you have a fibreglass seat. The fibreglass seat sits on a metal frame. The metal frame has a shock absorber underneath it. You put these little miniature crutches in your arms and they've got little baby skis on the end of them. And by using that, you can go down the slopes. I was amazed, couldn't believe it. I thought, wow, that's incredible. And it became a little seed of hope. Um, and that seed sort of started to take root. And it was, it, yeah, it was fed by quite a bit of morphine um, at the time. And I got a bit carried away with myself. Uh, and then I sort of, sort of thought, yeah, you know what? I, I could, I could, I reckon I could do this. I could learn to ski. And then I could challenge myself to be the best skier that I could be. Uh, which would mean I'd need to get into the British team and then I would need to compete against other skiers. So, oh, I don't know, I tell you what, I'm going to learn to ski, get in the British team and go to the Paralympics. And so that became my goal. It sounds a bit crazy and a lot of people told me I was crazy. Um, but I thought, you know what, let's set, let's set myself a new goal, right? I'm not going to be a head teacher anymore. I'm going to become a Paralympic skier. Right, I don't even know if I can ski, but I'm going to give it a go. And I started to think, well, how am I going to get, get around to doing it? I mean, if we look down here at the bottom, there's me, 2003, in hospital. Here is the Winter Paralympics, seven years away, right? You look at it in one go, it looks like a step that is just too big. It is a challenge too difficult. Then sometimes when we set ourselves challenges, when you just look at it in an instant, and you look at where you are and where you need to finish, it looks really, really difficult. But I started to realise that, you know what I've got to do? I've got to break it down into little steps so that I can start working my way forwards. Uh, and so the first thing was to survive, to stay alive. You know, that 
I wasn't going to be able to do anything if I'm dead. Um, what I had, I believe, as an advantage over lots of other people was that I had that idea. I had positivity uh, in my mind. And it's, it's amazing how powerful a positive idea can be, uh, how much it helps you uh, to, to overcome incredible odds. You know, you've got something to aim for. You've got that light at the end of the tunnel. You've got that branch to hold on to. Uh, and so that positivity really helped me through those initial weeks of, of trying to survive because I've, I've made this choice, you know, and this is only about two weeks after my accident. Still don't know if I'm going to survive yet. Um, you know, I'm still in intensive care. Um, so first thing, survive. If I survive, then I have to rehab. So rehabilitate. I had to learn how to be a wheelchair user. I had to learn to push myself about in one of these things, you know. Um, then I had to learn to be independent, you know, I had to learn to do things like driving a car. OK, I've got a car now. It's automatic. Yeah. And there are two metal rods that go down to the accelerator and to the brake. Right. That comes to a hinge point, which is underneath the steering column. And that comes to a little handle next to the steering wheel. So I pull on the handle, makes the car go. I push, makes the car stop. You know, it really is that simple. Steer with my left hand, pull and push. That's all, you know. But in hospital, didn't even know how I was going to get in a car, let alone drive one. So things like independent living, then learning to ski. You know, don't even know if I can do this yet. So then I've got to find out how do I go about learning to ski? Getting into the team, training, racing, all those things, building all the way up to being selected for the Paralympics. Because even if you're in a national team, it does not necessarily mean you will go to the Olympics or Paralympics. Uh, by right, you have to meet the selection criteria. So that sort of became my basic step-by-step -step method. Um, and I'd taken the hardest step, which was the first one, was to make a decision to do something, to uh, give myself a goal, to give myself something to look forward to, to give myself hope. And here I am in bed uh, back in 2003 in the hospital. Uh, I was on a tilting bed and so every three hours I got tilted from one side to the other and that's to help uh, prevent bed sores from, from happening. And one of the big things I had to begin to do was accept what had happened. Um, you know, when, all, when, when lots of things happen to us or when you know, significant things happen to us, uh, one, of the, one of the things we need to do is to accept it uh, because acceptance is part of uh, the healing process and when bad things happen part of the acceptance process is to grieve um, and I was in an eight bed unit uh, there were eight grown men and at night you would often hear people sobbing sobbing for the life that they had lost grieving for the life they had lost and that was part of the healing process it was part of accepting accepting this new life and it's uh, it's not always easy to do and to be honest it's taken me it well it took me I should say it took me 13 years to really be okay with uh, being in a wheelchair you know I, I finally had a breakthrough moment after 13 years um, but the process began started all the way back in 2003 you know, grieving, allowing myself to be upset, uh, to grieve over the, the trauma, the change. Um, it's difficult. It's not always easy. You know, we're in hard times at the moment, but we have to accept them. We have to accept what is going on in order to be able to make our way forwards uh, with our own, you know, mental health. I won't go through too much about the hospital time, but basically I had a few setbacks here and there, got ill, all the rest of it, um, but finally got to a position where I was able to leave hospital in about six and a half months after my original injury. So it wasn't the two years that I was told, uh, so we decided to have a big party to celebrate, to for me to say thank you to all the people that made it possible for me to be in a position to be able to leave hospital and move on to the next stage of my life. 
so there were the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare assistants, the physios, you know, the OTs. There were so many people, my friends, my family. And so we had a big party to celebrate the achievement, to reward all those that put in the effort to help me and also to uh, reward the effort that I put in as well. You know, I spent a lot of time trying to get to the gym, uh, all sorts of rehabilitation and stuff that I had to go through. Uh, and by rewarding ourselves, we all felt good about reaching one of those milestones, about reaching one of those important steps. And, you know, by feeling good about reaching the step and rewarding ourselves for reaching this step, we all felt positive about it and therefore wanted to go on to the next step and the next one. So it sort of builds that forward momentum it builds that feel good factor about reaching a goal you know if you never take time to to stop and reward yourself and recognize your achievement then you feel like you're just going you know around a circle or you're just on a treadmill uh, take time to recognize and reward yourself when you reach certain milestones you feel good about yourself and you recognize what you've done and you want to go on to the next one and the next step oh, was to go skiing. I was really excited when this happened. So I went with a charity called Backup, and they are a charity that help people who've had spinal cord injuries go off and do exciting stuff. And I went to a place called Winter Park, it's in America, and they have a, a great center to help people who are disabled to learn to ski. I was assessed by the instructors, and they told me that because I was a high level paraplegic, I was gonna be in a bi-ski. So, this is a bi-ski, right? It's got two skis underneath it. It's low to the ground, it's really stable. Uh, and by the end of the morning, I was flying around the mountain. It was amazing. I was turning left and right. Oh, it was just fabulous. I couldn't believe it. And I thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I went back in at lunchtime and I spoke to the others that were on my course and I told them just how amazing I was. Uh, full of my own self-importance and greatness, uh, thinking that I was going to be the, the next big thing in ski racing. And, uh, and surprisingly, they all laughed at me. I was like, what are you doing laughing at me? Uh, have you not seen how amazing I am out there? I'm going to be an incredible racer. Ha, they said, uh, you can't race in a bi-ski. The only thing you can race in is a mono-ski. Oh, I didn't know what one of those was, so I went back to the instructor. I said, hello, Mr. Instructor. I want to be a ski racer, can I have a monoski please? And he said, uh, no. And I said, well, why not? And he explained that because I'm a high level injury, right, so my level of injury is right up here, just at sort of uh, sternum level across nipples and everything, I have, I have no core stability, I have no balance, you know? If I put an arm out to one side and I let go of my wheelchair, I simply fall over. If I put my arms out in front of me, only go to there and then I start tipping forward. So he explained that, you need to have core stability in order to ski a monoski. I said, but I want to become a racer. Can I, can I please have one? Go, go, let me have a go. He said, no, 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 no. All you're going to do is fall over. You're going to fail. I whinged and I moaned and finally he gave in and he said, all right, look, I'll tell you what, we'll let you have a monoski, but believe us, all you're going to do is fall over and you're going to fail. I said, what do you know? I've been skiing all morning. Amazing. So, after lunch, I was in my monoski. I looked at my instructors. I said, all right, lads, let's go watch this. And I set off and I went three yards. Whoop! I was straight over. Oh, picked up, dusted the snow off myself. I looked at them and went, that was my pretend go. This is my real go. And I set off again. I went another three yards. Bam. Straight down again. Picked up, dusted the snow. I was thinking, hmm, this isn't going quite as I planned, but Third time lucky. It's always third time lucky. No problems. I set off again. I went three yards or so. And I fell over. And for the next five days, all I would do was go three yards, maybe five yards and fall over. I was rubbish. I was the worst pupil they'd ever had. I had little tantrums. I had little hissy fits. I just kept falling and failing and I was on the bunny hill. This is the, you know, a really flat slope. And in order to go up it, you've got a magic carpet to go up. So it's not even a lift, right? And I just fell over all the time. The three-year-olds that were on it were going up and down, up and down, up and down. And they were skiing way better than me. And I was just a disaster. And it got to the sixth day 
and the instructor said, right, enough is enough. We're going to put you back in the bike ski. You're going to go off. You're going to cruise around the mountain just like everyone else. And you're going to forget about being a racer. Oh, I was devastated. I was like, look, please, please, just let me have one more go. Just give me one more chance. And I whinged and moaned as only I can. And finally they agreed. And I said, all right, I'll tell you what, we'll give you one more go. But this time we're going to take you to the top of the mountain. So they put me on the chairlift, took me to the top of the mountain, got off, turned around and looked down. I was like, oh my word, that is a long way down. I mean, if I crash every five yards, it'd be like spring by the time I get down the bottom, the snow will have melted all along. And sometimes when we are trying to do something, we try so hard that we get in our own way. Uh, sometimes we just have to let our own ability come through our own natural ability uh, and I was just trying so hard and I was trying to ski like someone who was able-bodied so something in the past I had to let go of that and I had to be in the moment I had to forget about the past or the future I just had to be in the moment and I took a deep breath cleared my mind and I set off and I went two yards, three yards, five, ten, started to pick up some speed, heading across the slope. I was like, oh, I better do a turn. And I did a little turn and I went across the other way. And then I did another turn and I picked up some speed and suddenly I found myself going down the mountain and I was doing left turn and right turn and left turn and right turn. Oh my word. And then I came to a stop and I hadn't fallen over and I looked up and down. I was like, oh my word, I've just come halfway down the mountain. Oh, maybe if I practice, maybe if I practice really hard, I'll get from the top to the bottom in one go without falling over. That'll be my new goal. And four days later, I did. I managed it just the once to get from the top to the bottom without falling over. And I was over the moon. I couldn't believe it. I was so happy. You know, and, and sometimes when we're trying to do things, you know, we come across a uh, an imaginary brick wall that is stopping us from moving forwards and you're hitting the brick wall time and time again but you're not progressing you're not getting any further and you get to that point where you say you know what I give up and you walk away from the brick wall I would always advise you to go back hit that brick wall give it one more go because you will be amazed how many times that wall will fall down and open up that pathway to you because if I hadn't given it one more go I wouldn't have had my breakthrough and I wouldn't have become a skier. I wouldn't have become a racer and everything would be very, very different in my life. Always got to give it one more go. Now, I went skiing again uh, about a month later and this time to Whistler in Canada. And whilst I could sort of stay upright, I couldn't really control going left and right. And I was just like, oh my God, how am I going to get any better? What have I got to do? I mean, my able-bodied instructors, they're really nice, but they don't know what it's like for me. Well, as with all things, if you want to get good at something, you've got to go and find the experts. And for me, the experts were the British Disabled Ski Team. So I went and skied with them. I talked to them, watched them, skied with them. And what I discovered is that I needed to do some further adaptions uh, to my sit ski. And in fact, what we did is we took off a, a big strap from my rucksack and I put it around the, the back of my sit ski and looped it over my shoulders and down to my sort of belt that went around my tummy. And by that way, I could sort of shrug my shoulders and, and try to cause a bit of control over my hips, because every time it, the sit scheme dropped, I couldn't control it with my hips, I just kept falling over. And therefore, by putting this rudimentary shoulder straps on, I was able to start controlling the sit ski by shrugging my shoulders. And I was able to go through the course that the, the coach had set. Uh, and by doing that, I was actually invited to join the development squad. And so 14 months after my accident, I've been invited to join the development squad. Um, and so I sent that newspaper article off to my consultant to say, you know, look what I've done. You know, you told me I've been in hospital for two years. However, I have managed to come this far in just 14 months. You know, let's start telling people what they can do rather than what they can't do. You know, give people hope, 
tell people what is possible and then it will be up to them as to when they start to take on those challenges but know that the doors you know and opportunities of life are still open rather than being shut which they do now I can't ski all the time so I had to think of other things to do to help me with my skiing um, Water skiing, you can do, uh, even though you're paralysed, right? At Junction 13 of the M25, there's a place called Heron Lake. It's dedicated for disabled water skiing. And by doing that, it's really good for my balance. Um, now, the other thing that I'm very, very good at is crashing, right? And the first thing that hits the, the ground are normally my shoulders. So in order to protect the shoulders, uh, to prevent any breakages, you know, I try to build up the muscle mass around them as much as possible. So by using a hand cycle, I can do that. I can build up muscle mass. So water skiing is good for balance. Hand cycling, well, injury prevention. Now they aren't skiing, but they are helping you with your skiing. So if you can't do the one thing, you know, and that's pretty apparent at the moment in lockdown, you know, what other things can you do that will help you reach your long-term goal. Yeah, sometimes we've got to think laterally. Uh, but when you when you are able to, you have to practice and you have to do purposeful practice. Um, so training in gates, you know, there's no point in me just going out and skiing. Yes, skiing will help me. And if I just ski runs, well, I can choose where I ski. The hardest thing is obviously turning around gates you know, where you and taking the line that you are forced to take. Uh, so you've got to do purposeful practice in order to get better. And, you know, it is only practice that will help you. You know, if you play a sport, if say you play football, you know, and you only you play on a Saturday or a Sunday, uh, you aren't going to improve from one week to the next if you don't actually do anything in between, whether or not it's fitness or training, whatever it is, you've got to put in purposeful practice in order to improve yeah and for for, for skiing you uh, you've also got the added uh, aspect of having to travel so I had to spend sort of months and months away from uh, the UK traveling to well New Zealand uh, traveling down to South Korea for, for competitions all around the world you know and that puts a lot of pressure on you financially uh, and also on time, you know, being away from home and, and, and you know, those are difficult things to do, you know, uh, and uh, it's not for everybody. Um, and here's a little video, uh, if you've never seen someone who sat down skiing before. And I, I hope it comes through, I'll just watch this. So we got on the lifts just like everybody else. warm up just outside the gate so you don't go into them straight away. Use the little stubbies to practice with. Don't know how loud it is, hopefully it's not too bad. Slalom, twist and turny, then you go to giant slalom. A little bit quicker, still turning left and right. Then you've got to find them to carve the ski rather than skidding it sideways. The carve is quicker. This is super G, so you're starting to get quite quite quick now. So maybe 50 miles an hour. And then finally you get to do downhill. Obviously downhill means go downhill as fast as possible. Uh, the fastest so far that I've managed to clock up in a sit ski is 83 miles an hour. So even sat, sat down, you can still go very, very quickly. Um, and you've got to go out there and train in all the conditions, not just when it's nice and sunny and it, it's all going your way. You know, sometimes there might be so much snow, you've got no idea which way is up or down. Uh, sometimes it's sort of six o'clock in the morning, it's minus 25 Celsius. You've got to go out to get to the top of the mountain to go and inspect the course first thing. You have no desire to be there because it's just so bitterly cold, but you've got to go out there. Or it rains, you know, it does rain on the mountains. I'm happy to report that, you know, there is one team that goes out and trains in the rain. It's the British, 
you know, we're out there, got umbrellas, we look a bit weird, but we're out there and we're doing it in all the conditions, not just when it's sunny, not just when it feels nice. Yeah, you've got to put in the miles, even when it doesn't favour you. And you've got to be prepared for failure. You know, for skiing, failure also involves injury. Yeah, um, when you crash, you've got two things you've got to be uh, mindful of. One is the physical rehabilitation. Yeah, you know, when you crash, smash your shoulder, you've got to rehab the shoulder. But then there's also the the mental side, the the confidence. Uh, I crashed at 60 miles an hour in a downhill race. I uh, took a massive tumble, was strapped to a spine board, suspected broken neck, uh, really damaged my shoulder. And it took quite a few months for the shoulder to heal. However, it took me about a year mentally to be able to go at that sort of pace again because I was worried about crashing. I was worried about, you know, being paralysed from the neck down. You know, it was bad enough being paralysed from this level down. I didn't want to be paralysed from here down. Then I'd have lost the use of my arms. I would have lost my independence. So there's aspects that you've got to be careful of when you fail. Um, confidence and physical rehab. I mean, hopefully for most people, if you have a, a, a failure at work, it's it's just working on the confidence issue. You, 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 you know, you don't have any physical aspect to it. Um, but be mindful of that and be mindful that it takes a long time to rebuild your confidence. Yeah, it doesn't happen overnight it takes a long time you know as i said it took me a year uh, to regain my confidence in order to ski quickly again and you know there were as i said you know a number of setbacks uh you trying to find the cost um you know it was twenty five thousand pounds a year uh, to go skiing and you know, we didn't get any support uh, it got to a point where I would try and only eat every other day during the summer so that I could save money. Uh, the injuries, you know, managed to break a lot of myself because it turns out I'm really good at crashing. Um, you know, I had to leave behind my wife. I had to leave behind my friends, my family and everybody. And it's, it's a big choice. Uh, and sometimes when you get presented with really hard choices, you know, the path of least resistance, the easiest thing to do is to give up. You know, that's always the path of least resistance is, is to give up. But if you choose the harder path, the, the one where you keep on taking even the smallest of steps, you know, you can choose to keep going in the direction of your goal. And if you choose to do that, and if you believe in yourself, you can reach your goals. And so seven years, practically to the very day, when I said that I would learn to ski get in the British team, go to the Paralympics. I went up the ramp into the opening ceremony of the 2010 Winter Paralympics. And I was there as your athlete. I was there as your representative. And I was both uh, honoured and humbled to be there at the same time. Uh, and I wanted to do well. I wanted to ski really well. Uh, and certainly up at the time, uh, I was, I was skiing really, really well, you know, up at the top in the training course. I was absolutely flying through it. And I thought, this is it. This is my time. This is, I'm, I'm going to win the gold medal. And it came to the race of the Super G. And I thought, this is it. This is the chance. This is the one thing I need to do. Um, what I needed to do actually was to give myself a good start because that was the weakest area of my skiing. And uh, it came to the day of the Super G race and this one, this picture here on the, the, the right is me going out the start gate and I gave myself the best start I had ever done. And by the time I went past that cameraman, I thought, that's it, I've won the gold medal. It's in the bag. Uh, you know, I've done the hard thing, which was to get out the gate as quickly as possible and I've done it. Um, and I got to the corner at the first gate, I should say, I got to the first gate and I put the ski on the edge. And instead of it carving around like it had done at the top where we were training, it started to skid and to slide. And I got to the next corner and again, I put the ski on its edge. And instead of it carving around, it started to skid and slide again. Because what had happened is at the top of the mountain where we were training, it had snowed and it had fallen as snow. Halfway down the mountain, just where our start was, that snow had fallen as rain. And so rain changes the structure of the snow. It sort of turns it slushy. 
Then, a few days later, the temperature dropped and plummeted and it turned that sort of slush into ice. So effectively, skiing down a, an ice rink. And I'm not very good in icy conditions. You can see from the picture that because I ski using my shoulders, I have to tip my entire body, right? I can't bend at the waist. If I could bend at the waist, I could push the ski down into the hard stuff, into the, into the ice, into the hard snow. But I can't, it's the nature that I ski, you know, I tip, okay? Went down the mountain as fast as I possibly could. And I went through the finish line and I looked up at the leaderboard and my name, one at the top, one on the second line, one on the third line. I had to look a very long way down to find my name. And there I was down in 25th position. And I felt devastated. I felt a failure. I felt I'd let you all down. I didn't know what I was going to do. How could I possibly come back to the UK? And I went back um, to the Athletes Village and I was just in my room sobbing. And, you know, my coach came out, she had a chat with me, she asked me about the race. And I said that I, you know, I'd given my best start uh, and that all the way down, I'd, I'd been holding on to that edge as hard as possible. I'd been going as fast as I possibly could. I gave absolutely everything. At which point she put her arms around me, she gave me a hug and she told me that she was proud of me because I'd given my all. And to her, that was the most important thing, that on the day I had given my all. Okay, she didn't worry about where I'd come, but that I'd given absolutely everything. And so now, uh, having had time to reflect upon it, I'm very proud of my 25th. You know, I'm sorry it's not a gold medal and I can't sit here and show you one. Uh, but on the day I gave my all, I gave absolutely everything, and I'm very pleased and proud of my 25th. And that was in March of 2010. Okay, if we go through to December 2010, right, it's the very next race. It's the opening race of the new season. It's the Super G and all the same people are there. However, this time conditions are really, really soft. Uh, and that suits me absolutely down to the ground. And I went out the start gate, it was a really great start. I was in the right place all the way down the course. I went through the finish line and I didn't look at the leaderboard because I changed the way that I was thinking. I knew that when I went through the finish line, I had given my best performance and I couldn't have gone any quicker. So I was going to be really happy with that. And I went through the corral area, saw my teammates headed over towards them and they were jumping up and down. And I was like, guys, what's going on? They said, you're in the lead, you, you, you've beaten everybody, but over a second. Uh, and I went on to win the gold medal. So in one race, I give my absolute best and I come 25th. In the very next race, I give my absolute best and I win the gold medal. I went on to become European champion that year. You know, I'm equally proud of both because on both occasions, I gave my best performance. And that is all that we can ever ask of you. That you believe in yourself, that you trust in yourself and that you give your best performance. And if you do that, you can be happy and proud of everything that you do in your life.